Welcome to Insights, everyone. I'm Nnam Diodiko. The global health emergency, COVID-19, has impacted hugely on the health sector, so much that we have witnessed the shifting of massive health care resources, mostly to COVID-19 response efforts. How that affects other healthcare delivery services for, for instance, routine immunization is part of what we intend to talk about on this episode of the program. Flooding is another clear and present danger for several states in Nigeria. We will attempt to get some updates on the situations in some states. Elizabeth Omori is here as usual and she's set for our segment. Elizabeth? All right, on the media review segment this week, we're also towing the path of health. We'll be taking a look at primary health care, how to reposition it and ensure that the people get qualitative health care services. Indeed, very well. Let's get started. Immunization is the core health service that should be prioritized for the prevention of communicable diseases and safeguarded for continuity, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. To speak to this issue, I have joining me the Chief Executive Director, CEO, the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, Dr. Faisal Shuaib. Welcome to Insight. Thank you for having me. I, I will begin with a very basic um, question, perhaps a confirmation of the true status of routine immunization under COVID-19. Uh, I know that at the onset of the breakout in Nigeria, uh, people were advised to, to only visit the hospitals for emergencies. Please confirm uh, whether or not routine immunization services were permitted at, um, at the time and were indeed delivered in hospitals across the country uh, during the emergency regulations. Right. Uh, the guidance that we gave uh, the general uh, public was that um, in spite of the COVID-19 outbreak, that uh, parents uh, and guardians should actually take their kids uh, for routine uh, immunization services. Uh, so uh, we actually sent out a public service uh, announcement uh, emphasizing that despite the restrictions, uh, because of how important it is uh, for uh, kids to get their vaccinations, that uh, uh, parents will actually continue. Uh, can, can you tell us how immunization delivery strategies have been adapted and, and are currently being conducted under safe conditions without undue harm to health workers, the caretakers, and by extension, uh, caregivers, I beg your pardon, and, and by extension, the communities? Right, so what we did from the get-go, once we uh, realized that there was a chance that there would be community transmission of COVID-19, uh, we quickly uh, pulled together uh, our trainers and uh, we did uh, virtual trainings of uh, healthcare workers at the national level, stepped that, that down to the state level, and then at the LG and community level, we did uh, some in-person uh, training. So in the course of uh, the first few months of the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, actually uh, we trained over 200,000 primary healthcare workers. This is what provided them with the skills, the knowledge uh, to understand how to manage uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, first, in terms of making sure that uh, they reimagined uh, the uh, spaces within their health facilities in a way uh, that ensured uh, that there was triaging, that is to say, identifying uh, clients that have uh, symptoms or signs that are suspicious, you know, that sound or appear to be that of COVID-19, making sure that they do not come in contact with the general population, and then making sure that these were well uh, treated uh, or manage in a way uh, that was respectful, that was dignifying, uh, so that people don't feel stigmatized, and then making sure that there was a referral uh, to the uh, disease surveillance and notification officer. But beyond that, as part of the training, I also made sure uh, that the health workers had the equipment that they needed. So we provided uh, the face masks, uh, we provided uh, facilities for them to wash hands and also to sanitize. And then, you know, by providing this type of uh, 
uh, equipment and also the environment, uh, the health workers felt uh, pretty much uh, more confident that they'll be able to provide the services and also the clients uh, felt more comfortable. So we started from a situation where uh, people were concerned or afraid of going to the health facilities to a situation where they felt a whole lot better. So we looked at uh, the data and we saw that in the months after the uh, imposing, in, imposition of uh, the lockdown that there was a decline in access to routine immunization and other primary health care services. But by the time we finished the training and there was uh, a lifting of the lockdown, uh, we found that uh, some of these services are now beginning uh, to move on the uptick. So there's a gradual improvement in uh, access to these uh, health um, you know, services. Uh, very well. In most cases, there are calendars for national immunization, even though most states have their own peculiarities. Uh, what guidance are you currently, I mean, you now as an agency, are currently giving to member states on how best or what best steps to take to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on other preventable, vaccine preventable diseases? Yeah, the great thing about uh, the COVID-19 outbreak is that uh, we've learned on, on the job from a situation where we were ultimately, you know, clueless about what it was all about, apart from what we read in the papers and on the media, we now have a better understanding that the COVID-19 uh, outbreak uh, does not mean that everybody is going to catch the virus and everybody is going to be sick and people are going to die. Yes, people are dying and of course we understand that there's been, you know, maybe a thousand or so more deaths mm -hmm. than, than necessary. But uh, in the course of all of that, uh, what has happened is that we have been able to do risk communication uh, in our collaborations with uh, agencies such as the NCDC, uh, the Federal Ministry of Health. Uh, the PTF has been very, very, uh, you know, uh, supportive in terms of allowing us to carry out our mandates. Now, uh, health workers understand uh, that uh, they need to continue uh, the services, but do uh, these services in a way uh, that uh, safeguards uh, their health. And um, the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Ihanire, has been, you know, up uh, and um, proactive in making sure that that communication goes out, that, um, yes, the services must continue, but they have to be contextualized, contextualized in a way that fits the different uh, conditions of the state. And this is why we've been working with the Nigeria Governors Forum, we've been working with our governors, with the commissioners, with the executive secretaries of uh, primary health care board to make sure that even as we provide a general national guideline, that they have uh, the uh, wherewithal, they have the opportunities to customize and contextualize uh, these guidelines uh, to their local situations. Uh, very well, again. So you, you already preempted my question. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we do know that uh, as an agency, you preempted pre preparations for community transmission of um, a coronavirus. I, I do know that you carried out um, trainings of um, caregivers and personnel at primary health care centers across the country. In fact, you mentioned the data, you mentioned the number, uh, about 200,000 of them, uh, as a matter of fact. I am, however, worried about the medium used for the training and whether or not you got the desired results. Uh, it was a virtual meeting, like you said, and, um, and I know you can understand, I, I can understand that considering the times, uh, but then, are you sure you, the, right, the right messages were passed to the trainees, con considering the fluctuating nature of ICT connections across the country? And do tell, uh, what are the feelers you got in the immediate aftermath of the training and, um, and over time? Right. I mean, uh, Namdi, you're, you're absolutely right uh, to be suspicious of any virtual <laughs> training in, in, because it's something that we've never done right in the past. But uh, it was it, the first time. As absolutely a right. So they said there's always a first time for everything. Right. And the uh, lesson that we learned from that is that, you know, if we do not start, how else are we going to be uh, certain that our healthcare workers will be prepared? To provide the services for for Nigerians, so as an agency, you know, we took the first leap of faith, and uh, we trained uh, people at the national level completely uh, using virtual means. Uh, mm -hmm. We used uh, webinars, we used uh, Zoom, and uh, after training them, uh, we conducted a uh, a post test. So there was a pre 
and the posters okay. to assess, to evaluate if there was learning, right? If at all people were able to get it. And we had a benchmark of 80% uh, as, okay. as the pass mark, right? So with this, we did exactly the same thing at the state level to make sure that there was understanding. Now, when we got to the LGA level and the community level, we're well aware that there will be challenges with people having networks and people understanding how to use the equipment. So in those instances, what we did was to get large classrooms, right. observed social distancing, uh, making sure that every participant and the trainers also had uh, face masks and uh, there was sanitizing on the hands. So that was possible at the lower level. Mm -hmm. But in each of these levels, we made sure that there was a pre and a post test. And for those who scored below 80%, uh, we made sure that they were trained again and retested. If they're not able to make the mark, then you know they are dropped and other people uh, were trained. So at the end of the day, we were pretty confident that from a knowledge base uh, level, uh, mm -hmm. we've been able to communicate exactly what we wanted them uh, to, to learn. But we have also, as an agency, gone to the field to monitor the level of compliance and to also mentor, do on the job mentoring of all of the people that we have trained to make sure that they are also doing the right things, even at the community level, making sure that from one community to the, uh, to the other, even if the medium of communication, the languages might, might be different, mm. the messaging is consistent across the risk communication is consistent i've been working with the uh, traditional leaders uh, in our communities to make sure that uh, we have that consistency in terms of messaging the blueprint is now being replicated in other west african countries because uh, we were the first country um, we we're the first agency to produce uh, the preparedness and response plan uh, at the primary health care level, but we also went ahead and produced uh, guidelines, uh, tutorials, uh, you know, and training documents that other uh, West African countries, other African countries are now, you know, borrowing from us. They've been calling us to ask us how we did it, and we've been providing them with that kind of information. So we're really, really excited about how we've been able to use a challenge and change it into really an opportunity to train not only on COVID-19, but it mm -hmm. was the first opportunity in a very long while for us to train primary health care workers at the operational level on basic primary health care practices, how to treat uh, patients mm. uh, with compassion, with dignity, with respect. Mm. We've not done that in several decades. So to be able to train over 200,000 um, primary health care workers in one fell swoop over the course of uh, three to four weeks, it's been an amazing journey. In practical terms, how has that translated to, to, to boosting com confidence in service delivery at um, primary health, cent um, health care centers? Um, of course, I, I know you have your people on the ground and you've been getting feelers. Um, and at the onset of COVID-19, there were fears like we've talked about at the beginning. Uh, but has that changed? Has the perception, uh, perception changed? Uh, are, are people now coming to healthcare centers, I mean, confident in the quality of service that they, 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 they will get or could get? And uh, without also, uh, of course, the fears might still be there, but is it, uh, has that reduced substantially? No, absolutely. It's like night, night and day. At the beginning of the pandemic, you know, there were instances where, you know, community members will say, you know, I will not even go to, say, Guagolada at all. Exactly. Just because there's a, a, an isolation center in, in Guagolada. But right now, what we're seeing is that community members are now more relaxed. You know, they're seeing that... Uh, uh, even if you contract COVID-19, it's not a death sentence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, President Muhammad Buhari has been very, very clear, very strong uh, in his support of the presidential task force. He has urged all Nigerians uh, to obey and follow the guidelines of uh, the presidential task force. And part of these guidelines as clearly and well articulate, articulate, articulated by uh, the Honorable Ministers of Health during their press briefing mm. is the need for these routine services uh, to continue. And because of that clear communication, what we have seen from the data is that from March there was a decline in routine services, routine okay. primary health care services. But from uh, the month of uh, June, we are beginning to see that that decline has now uh, reversed. We are seeing an optic. We can see now uh, from the data that uh, people are now beginning, beginning to come uh, to the health facilities and access uh, care. So 
there's a direct link between uh, the confidence uh, that has been provided by the presidential task force uh, mm -hmm. and also the training that we have given uh, to primary health care workers that has now, you know, imbibed in them a confidence that they are able to protect themselves and also protect uh, their clients from uh, COVID-19. And that is what uh, they really needed. And of course, the fact that the governors, the commissioners are actually providing uh, the uh, equipment that really really helps the ppes the personal protective equipments uh, you know sanitizers and all of that guidelines that has really helped in no small measure to uh, boost the confidence of health workers that yes they can manage uh, routine services even in the face of uh, covid 19. Uh, Dr. Shuai, we, we know that pre-COVID-19 we had uh, very serious issues with Mathana and child deaths and we're, we're working continuously towards f strengthening primary health care, again towards achieving universal health coverage. Uh, Substating challenges inhibiting progress towards the goals we may have set are now exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, what percentage of Nigerians have been captured pre-COVID-19 and how do you expect for indigent members of our society or communities, for instance, to to choose between healthcare, um, healthcare, and other daily expenses like like food, clothing, and even housing. Uh, do you think that that can come easy, especially with COVID nineteen, especially at rural communities uh, at that level? Yes, this is a struggle that every uh, Nigerian has to live with, especially uh, with uh, the majority of uh, uh, Nigerians uh, who. Uh, live uh, below uh, the, the poverty line. Uh, so this is why uh, the Basic Health Care Provision Fund is transformative, right? This is uh, a fund of an average of about 55 billion uh, naira that President Muhammad Buhari has, uh, you know, assented to that is being released uh, by the Federal uh, Ministry of Health. This is targeted towards uh, universal health coverage. At the end of the day, mm. because of the Basic Health Care Provision Fund, uh, the Federal Ministry of Health, working with the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, uh, with the National Health Insurance Scheme, will be able to provide funding for basic health services in a way that uh, when Nigerians go to primary health care centers uh, in the next few months and the next few years, mm -hmm. they will not have to pay out of pocket catastrophic expenditures on, on health services will now be 18 of, of the past. This is within the milieu of uh, COVID-19 and all of the uh, challenges that, that it brings. So we're very optimistic that over time, uh, Nigerians will be able to afford uh, basic health care because the federal government, uh, working with the state government, has been able to uh, make, make these funds uh, available, mm. uh, even outside of the budget uh, that is uh, made for primary health care in, in the states. So we are really, really optimistic that this will transform uh, the primary health care space. Uh, well, 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 we're actually out of time, but well, before I let you go, one very quickly, one very quick um, question. Um, we, most agencies, even humans like us, we, we have a list, a priority list where we put our agendas and um, we probably choose either from the top or the bottom. And as an organization, as an agency for you, what, 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 are your, what, what is at the top of your priority uh, in terms of um, short, medium and long term target? Right. It, it, yeah, it will have to be that we have to cut down on the numbers of women and children under five that are dying from uh, preventable causes. Mm. Uh, we have to increase the quality uh, of uh, primary health care, have uh, increased access. But in the end, you know, long term, we would like to achieve universal health coverage so that wherever Nigerians live or work, they'll have access to basic quality uh, primary health care services that improves their health. Uh, Dr. Faisal Shuai, thank you, Executive um, Director, National Primary Health Care Development Agency, and of course, CEO of SIM Agency. Thank you so much for coming on Insight. It's been a pleasure um, talking to you on this matter. We would, uh, we would look for time to bring you back on the program so we can talk some more on these issues. Uh, of course, th these issues are still in play and we should be able to revisit them sometime real soon. Thank you so much for coming on Insight. Thank you very much for having me. Next, we take a look at how flooding in various parts of the country is wreaking havoc and causing further hardships on people already burdened by the impact of COVID-19. 
Almost every region of the country has witnessed massive flooding, displacing thousands, damaging livelihoods and threatening our national food supply. Let's get a sense of how serious, uh, serious the issues are. Um, Sani Dodo um, Do is the chairman, Kebi State Emergency uh, Management Agency, joins me from Brinin Kebi. Uh, Emeka Obinwa is also with us. He is the executive assistant media to the Anambra State Governor on SEMA. He joins us from Oka Anambra State. Um, gentlemen, welcome to Insight. I'll just go ahead um, with the chairman, Sema Kebi State. Um, can, can you give us a sense of how massive the damages are in your state? Yes, uh, exactly. Kebi State is uh, really affected by massive uh, flood. Because, uh, most of the local government uh, are now submerged. That is... Uh, the Fadama area of Cape State of about 600 kilometers was submerged by flood. Uh, because uh, right from the uh, to do uh, in our local government, which is bordering Sokoto State, uh, down to uh, Toga Bridge in Bagudo local government, also in Cape State, which covered about 350 kilometers. Uh, that is the the river uh, Bacalori uh, submerged. And then for the Tuga Bridge in Bagudo local government, in Geske local government, which is uh, very close to Kanji Dam, mm. bordering the charging point of this water, is about 250 kilometers, is also submerged. So uh, even the focus given to us earlier by the National Emergency, uh, by, by NIMET, NIMET yes. that about 11 local government at 100 and to Nigeria, uh, Cape State is expected to have 11 local government. Now, almost all the local government in Cape State are now affected by this flood. There is no local government in Cape State which is not affected by flood. That's at this material time I'm talking to you. So, honestly speaking, it comes to the extent that uh, this year, all our farmers, be it uh, retired civil servant, uh, service, civil servant, peasant, farmers, and even large-scale farmers. Everybody engaged in farming this year. Mm. But all what has been uh, planted, uh, most especially rice, is now submerged by water here in Kebi State. Oh, so honestly that, speaking, that's, that's quite unfortunate it's because stating, Kebi State is known, and, is and known Kebi for... State is really, I mean, I have a problem. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, I was just saying that that is quite unfortunate uh, because we do know Kebi State for uh, for rice cultivation. I, I mean, how has that affected this year's um, planting season for, for rice? Well, I think the, this year's uh, rice, honestly speaking, we have to go back uh, in the, for, for, for the dry season uh, uh, farming. But uh, the wet season farming, which uh, is a period now. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. It has been taken by, by the flood. But uh, the, His Excellency, my governor, mm. and uh, even this our agency, and uh, even the federal government, uh, now put ahead together. You see, recently the Minister of Agriculture, Mr. KB, and then we are put ahead together to see what we can do to go back to the dry season farming immediately after the water has recessed. But uh, as at now, there is, n there is n nothing, no hope about the rice farming season in Kevin State at this material time. Um, uh, Emeka Obimwa, uh, uh, this is an issue that should be, re uh, I mean, quite you, you, relatable um, for you, uh, because I do know that in the Anambra East and West um, axis of Anambra State, um, going from Ayam Elum to Anam and um, some riverine communities, Ogbaru and, uh, and others by the river bank, by the river Niger, I mean, th these are communities that, yeah, in their out get submerged, um, you know, by flood, uh, uh, flooding. Uh, I mean, uh, this year, uh, that hasn't happened yet, uh, but um, what are we hearing, what are we seeing on the ground? I mean, uh, um, uh, uh, is there growing fear that um, communities might be submerged again, uh, going by the forecast coming from NIMED and other uh, agencies? Are the people living in fear already in anticipation of what might come? Uh, 
Thanks, Namdi. Um, going by the predictions of uh, the relevant agencies, the NISA, Nigeria Hydrological uh, Services Agency, and NIMED, uh, there is this uh, fear that more local governments will be submerged this season because they predicted early rains from February that will last till late December this year. Mm. And uh, going by the prediction, they added some local governments that hitherto are not affected by flood. Some of these local governments are the upland local governments like uh, uh, Njikoka local government, like uh, Idemele North, and others. So we are taking into account of uh, the uh, impairment, and that's why uh, the State Emergency Management Agency has uh, already read off the, its uh, sensitization program okay. to all local governments and communities along the flood-prone areas in Anambra State. Okay, I worry that uh, uh, the rice farmers are around the Ayamelum axis um, um, and um, um, Ayamelum, Anam, and, and Ogbaru axis, where the where areas popularly known to for for the planting of rice for rice cultivation, uh, are there fears from that area as well? Yes, there, yes, there's this palpable fear that uh, there are uh, efforts in planting some of these uh, food crops will be nullity. And it formed a sensitization message that they should start early to begin to harvest their farm products so that they are not submerged when the flood comes. Uh, okay, uh, make up why it's a good thing that um, you've brought up the issue of um, um, population awareness and um, preparedness. I mean, it's one of the proactive flood control measures besides, uh, of course, besides other um, proactive measures. I mean, since you said that um, that has already begun, uh, um, uh, what, what, can, what feelers are you getting from communities um, previously impacted and how uh, has that helped you to perhaps um, prepare your message and is that helping to change minds in communities? Are, they, are you perhaps thinking of um, relocating people earlier from communities previously impacted uh, just to circumvent or just to, I mean, mitigate or rather, you know, pre to preempt whatever might be or what might happen if the flood does come? Yes, during our sensitization campaign, we advised them to be prepared, just like the scout uh, mantra would say, be okay. prepared. We asked them to pack their belongings, their important belongings, their medicants, clothes, certificates, and other so they, they are very, very useful to them, and get them to, so that at any point in time they are asked to leave, they will just pick them and then vacate. Okay, that's good to know. I'll yeah, go back it, it form, to... Yes, it formed part of the message. But, you know, the, 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 the people received this message with their mixed feelings. Okay. Some said they were not going to move because they are in tune with the, uh, you know, with the nature in that place that this has been happening to them. They're not going to move. But in this circumstance, we have to use persuasion. We have to advise them on the need in order not to lose life. Because life first in everything you do. Life first. So we Indeed. use persuasion, you know, ask them to move. So those of them that, uh, that would heed to the advice are evacuated to holding centers, the state government, to the benevolence of His Excellency. The executive governor of Anambra State, Chief Dr. Willie Obiano, has, in, in his wisdom, approved some funds to make sure that all these holding centers are made habitable for these uh, flood victims. And uh, it, it starts coming. 
Okay, thank you. I'll go over now to um, Sani Dododo in um, Brennan Kirby. Um, uh, well, we, we uh, as part of, um, we, we do know of the other long-term um, measures, you know, f preparatory uh, measures, but uh, let me take you up on the issue of population awareness and sensitization of um, the populace, especially in some of these areas impacted by flooding now. I mean, how much of a campaign did the state government, in fact, did your agency, SEMA, uh, carry out in some of these areas, and did you succeed them in moving uh, some communities away before the flood submerged them? Well, exactly. Immediately we received the signal from the NAMIT that uh, uh, about a little local government are going to be affected. We, we immediately summoned the meeting of all the chairmen of those local governments, uh, including the traditional rulers and even the uh, Commissioner for Local Government and Students' Affairs in Cape State, we intimate them that blood is imminent. They have to go back and start some the traditions that people in this local government mentioned earlier. But when we discovered that uh, it has gone beyond that, we also invited all the four emirates in Cape State, that the stakeholders, including security agencies, religious leaders, and uh, traditional rulers, and uh, even the paramilitary and even the military, we sat down with them. We said, please, gentlemen, you go back and touch your bell and uh, start informing people about the danger that of the flooding uh, here in, in, in Cape State. And uh, know fully that uh, Cape State is just like a valley. And uh, if you look at the geographical uh, position of Cape State, it is uh, like a valley. And then, all the uh, two dams, that one in Goreño, the other one in Bacalori, are now discharging water in Cape State. Mm. Uh, and then the 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 uh, Agassiz, which is the local government, which is bordering the Niger Republic, also the the, the water put in Cameroon and the Niger, Niger Republic are also discharging water in in, in in Cape State. And then we have what you call the Zampara, that is the Agassiz of Gumi. Uh, and uh, part of Shagari in Sokoto State are now discharging water also in, in Jiaga local government area where we have the capsize of both last time when we lost about 10 people, uh, eight people that were able to, discuss, uh, I mean, to, to, to rescue two people out of 10, but all the eight has, has, I mean, has died. And then by uh, knowing the position of our state, we vigorously embark on sensitization for our people to be relocated to the higher lands so that life and uh, property should be safe. But uh, the, when the water comes, uh, I mean, with all the effort and installation, we are assuming we are dealing with the nature. There's nothing you can do about it. But uh, all, all the same, His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Cape State, uh, Senator Abogra Atiku Bagunu Motuel Lengwendu, has uh, go around himself, including the official of my agency, we have gone around day and night, you know, going and to exercise and even try to relocate people to the upland or to the higher land. Now, in Cape State, we have so many, uh, I mean, IDP centers, uh, I mean, where we relocate people, most especially at uh, Bagudo local government. And now we have highly 50 local risk local government uh, where we have the following serious city. And uh, even the upland local government are not affected. But okay. uh, what we are doing now is that uh, we have so I mean two problems at hand. One, the you know the I mean the collapsing and uh, demolition of the houses by water, and mm. then the flooding. So flooding of farms and uh, even the houses of uh, people in the villages and the communities are also affected by by, by, by this flood. So we have a serious problem in Kibbutz. But uh, we are still embarking. On sensitization okay. and even electing people through radio, television, the town cries, and even our traditional institutions during a rain and a marine ceremony, naming ceremony. Uh, wherever we have a little gathering, we try to sensitize our people about uh, the, the, this problem of flooding. So, in terms of sensitization, we are doing everything humanly possible to educate our people about this flood here, here, here in Kevin State. Okay, so I understand that um, most um, primary schools in Algungu have become have been converted into shelter for those displaced 
by um, the, by the flooding. Uh, well, it, it, we're, we're in a period of the pandemic. Well, well, I mean, we're still reeling from the effects of the pandemic. What, what is the state government through through SEMA doing to ensure that um, these displaced persons, I mean, do not um, you nine know nine designated. Uh, uh, we have about nine designated uh, 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 centers where we, uh, I mean, locate uh, people in, in Argungu town only. Okay. So if you take the whole Argungu local government, we have about uh, 15 to 25 uh, 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 IDP centers. Okay, and, but my uh, question really isn't of, on the center. Uh, uh, I, I'm more concerned about the welfare of the people. What are you doing to ensure that, I mean, uh, they don't suffer much more than they already are? Uh, owing to the flooding, I mean, there's COVID-19 on the one hand, and now there's, they, they have been displaced by the flooding. Uh, what are you doing to ensure that, um, I mean, uh, they, that they get some sort of relative um, ease, I mean, from, from the tension and pressure, as it were? Did you get my question, sir? So what do we normally do when we have this problem? Well, we, we, we immediately, uh, I mean, jointly with Okay, we seem to be having some issues with um, um, Sunny Dododo's co um, connection it, from Berlin Kebe. I'll, I'll move on now, over now to Mekao Bingwa. All the people who in, are relocated. Um, I'll, um, why, I'll, I'll move over to Mekao Bingwa in Oka Anambra State. Are you still there? Oh, uh, great. Okay, so um, I mean, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, out like we talked I'm about sure, yeah. earlier, we, we get um, flooding in parts of Anambra. As a matter of fact, in some cases, even in the state capital, we experience flash flooding in Oka, in Oka, the state capital. I mean, what are some of the factors responsible for for these, and what is the state government doing to ensure that um, it does, they, they, I mean, it doesn't happen as it has happened in previous years? Uh, one of the major problems is that people build on water channels, on drainages. And again, people emptying their refuse in... They have been pulling down houses that are built on the flood channels. They have been on air warning people to desist, to stop from building on flood channels, on, on drainages. And they have been pulling those houses down. Okay. The Minister of Environment had engaged the workers to begin to clear the drainages. Even they have extended this invitation to local governments to make sure that all the drainages are desilted and uh, 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 the, the refuse are cleared so that water, the flood water, will have easy wear down to the channels. Uh, um, I'll get your final words now that I have you before I move over to Benin Kebi. Uh, what are your final words on the program as we, uh, as we look ahead and look forward to, to better times? I mean, a time when um, of, um, flooding would not displace, uh, especially indigent members from, I mean, from their communities. Well, I will advise them on behalf of STEMA to be prepared to be evacuated when the flood comes. Uh, thanks to His Excellency, the Governor of Anambra State, Dr. Wuli Obiano, for making funds available to make sure that this holding center is habitable, mm. are cleaned and fumigated to make sure that the flood victims are housed in these uh, holding centers, that they are comfortable and they don't suffer unduly because of flood uh, attack when it comes. Uh, so, so we much, are on being one. I'll just, the situation. Okay. Uh, I'll just move over now to Benin Kebi, where I have um, Sani Dododo. Um, is it still there? If you're there, uh, I'd like to get your final words. You were speaking earlier to the issue of um, efforts being put in place to uh, alleviate the plight um, of um, persons displaced by flooding in Kebi State. And can you just quickly take that as your final words, please? Well, I think uh, I have to thank my governor, His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Kebi State, Dr. Abakara Chikubagudubai, for providing 
uh, adequate fund for, I mean, for the agency. Uh, not only that, His Excellency released funds to all the to your local government in order to uh, also complement the effort of the uh, agency, that is our agency, SEMA. His Excellency is always done also uh, making money available to his uh, uh, wives also to go, go around uh, with her project to see what I mean, she can do as a, a medical director to assist the younger ones to provide medication. And on one end, we provide medication, food items, mosquito net, mosquito coil, even cooking pots and even firewood for all the displaced persons in order to cater for them to be uh, protected and provide and to make uh, uh, environment, uh, I mean, an enable environment for them so that they will feel uh, like government is, uh, is, is with them. Uh, and uh, not only that, uh, we are visiting them from time to time together with all the officials of the local government, director, social director, works uh, and director, agar who are our DEX officers, so that we can, uh, we have contact. Even our AMS and the traditional ruler, religious rulers, we jointly together and we have a tax force where we have the local government committee on SEMA going around to sensitize and ever taking care of all those people, providing security, toilet facilities, I mean, food items uh, and even the, the, the medication. So, I mean, uh, we also have, I want to use the opportunity to thank him, Mr. Uh, simple handedly for issuing a statement about the issue in case through his uh, media aid. And uh, also, uh, the Minister of Humanitarian Science, uh, idea. Also, for even mentioning my name, single handedly, and the same I came instead for our effort to cater for our people at this period, at this testing period. Great. So, I mean, I have to thank, thank you. We're, 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 we're out of time now. Sunny Dodo Do and um, Chairman Kebby State's um, Emergency Management Agency, uh, Mika Obimwa, Executive Assistant to the Governor Media on SEMA. I want to thank you both gentlemen for coming on Insight. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on Insight. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks very much for having indeed. Me. Up next is the media review segment. Thanks for joining us on the media review segment this week. Primary health care is a grassroots management approach to providing health care services to communities. Various countries have attained different levels of progress. How can the government redirect resources for health care from curative services to preventive services in order to provide primary health care infrastructures, encourage the migration of health workers from urban to rural areas, and provide acceptable level of health care services for all, thereby reducing the gross inequality in health status of the people. These are some of the areas my guest, Dr. Jane Igali, a family physician, will critically take a look at. Dr. Jane, it's nice to have you in our studio. Thank you for having me. All right, you are a stakeholder in the health sector. Mm -hmm. How would you assess primary health care in Nigeria currently? Um, like most aspects of our our health care, it's implementation that we look at. You know, most times people talk about primary health care and then there's no distinct difference between primary health care and the medical practice itself, like what you just said, preventive health care and curative. curative. So most times we talk about primary health care and what comes into your mind is what are we doing in the in the health the primary health care um, um, environment you know the hospitals the primary health care institutions and all that but the thing is primary health care the the reason why primary health care was instituted in the first place was not just because of the curative part it was about preventive all the way and when you want to assess primary health care, you have to assess it through what it is supposed to give that it is not given now. And that's why we are, when we are talking about what to do to change the effects that primary health care has brought to our system, we should be looking at what it is not doing yet. That is the prevention that it has not brought to the table. Okay. All right. Uh, we understand that the Buhari administration has done so much in terms of primary health care and then has put so much attention to resources uh, 
placement of resources into the health sector. Now, there's the issue of migration, health workers' migration from the urban to the rural areas. Why is this a challenge? Health care workers will always migrate if the environment they work is not conducive. The same thing with what is happening in other aspects of healthcare in Nigeria, that healthcare workers are migrating away from Nigeria itself okay. to other countries. That is because they, the people just want a situation where they feel um, better taken care of, better remuneration, better equipment and other things that they work with. Now in the local areas, so many other things come to play. It's not just about how much the healthcare worker is being paid. We talk about electricity. We talk about access. In fact, primary health care cannot happen just by the health sector. It is supposed to be one of the principles of the primary health care delivery itself. It's um, intersectoral coordination. Inter okay different sectors coming together to achieve the thing that the health sector is or make it a, a, something that the health, the, the, the effect of what the health sector is doing is reaching the people. And this can only happen when all the sectors are working together and providing the amenities that are affecting health in different aspects. Okay. Like for an example, for a, a health worker to be in a local place like um, you, you want to work in a primary health care located in a village that does not have accessible road, for an example. You would first of all think about your health okay. traveling on the road. And thinking about health insurance for the health worker himself and other things, you look at it and is this risk worth taking? And then you now go to the villages and realize that preven preventable diseases like just malaria, it's more there because the environment is not taken care of. Mm -hmm. So mosquitoes are breeding more. And so the people are more exposed to preventable diseases in those rural areas. So the health care workers themselves have the issues of their own health being at stake okay. through the roads and other things. And if they themselves need health care, what are they going to, what level of health care can they assess mm. being with their, their families in the village to take care of other people's health? So it's not just about them migrating or equipping the primary health care center as it were, okay. as to intersectoral coordination of every aspect of society working. So when primary health care is not delivering what it is supposed to deliver, it's not just about the fact that we don't have um, essential drugs in the hospital. It's not, that is not the only thing that is affecting it. It's every aspect of society working together. That is what it is supposed to be in the first place. And that is one of the reasons why um, healthcare workers tend to migrate from local areas to urban, urban areas and very difficult for them to migrate back okay. because of their families and their personal health too. Let's talk about the issue of acceptance. How is primary health care accepted in rural areas? And I'm happy your specialization speaks volume to our focus. It's supposed to be, by its definition, the essential health care that is available to them, right? But through their own participation. They are supposed to, the people in the community are supposed to be the ones accepting this health care and participating in it. Hmm. For example, when you talk about diarrhea, and the management of diarrhea entails a lot of, you know, dehydration comes in and you would require um, rehydration therapy, right? Now, in primary health care, you are making both the, the people that have the diarrhea, like the mother that has the child with the diarrhea, participate in, in giving this health care. Okay. So she is participating in delivering and learning how to give rehydration therapy by herself. Mm -hmm. So if it's about acceptance, acceptance or acceptability, primary healthcare is readily accepted because they are the ones that are part of delivery also. Okay. But then when it is not understood and the, the, the patients you're treating are not participating in the primary healthcare, we now start talking about accepting the healthcare, that is the medical care that is 
that is available in the medical health center. And health education is one of the components of primary health care. And that is supposed to be the solution to this. Because when people understand what they are going through, and they understand that they can participate in the solution they get, okay. and they know they can access that solution in the primary health care, mm -hmm. then they will naturally avail themselves in the primary health care to be treated by the personnel that are there. So, so this um, education, health education, and information should be at their fingertips. This is, these are the things I can get in the primary health care. And I think that is what's one of the things that are affecting um, acceptance, like you said, of primary health care centers okay. in Could the you population. Tell us how critical it is for us to equip PHCs so that we don't have people travel to other states or cities for health services. Yeah, it is very, very critical. If there is any other word I can use. If the people that are supposed to be treated in five minutes just because the primary health care is close to them are using maybe one or two days to get to the secondary health care system, you're already exposing the population to higher risk of whatever thing that would, would have been pre preventable, you see. So if we equip the health care, the primary health care system, and train the personnel that are supposed to manage them and bring in more confidence in the society so they know that these things are accessible and you can be treated in these places. You know, it will bring a lot of good to the healthcare system of the country. Okay. It's not just about the equipment itself, like I said. It, of course, equipment is necessary, but there are some healthcare, um, primary healthcare centers that have what it takes to take care of the people around, but they are not still assessed. So before we talk about government equipping everywhere mm -hmm. before people can assess it, let's talk about what we can do to help the people get prevent prevention that they can even assess. Because that in itself makes the healthcare system, the primary healthcare system, at least working. Dr. Jane, I would like to come in there. How oh. can we reposition our primary healthcare system? Implementation. Okay. Implementation of everything that government has promised the healthcare system. Community participation must be looked back on. Okay. How is the community participating in their own health? Mm. So you are not just waiting for them to say, there are no drugs in the primary health care, so I want to go to the teaching hospital. How are you participating in your own health? Because that is one of the major principles of primary health care. And if these things are not looked at, primary health care can't work. And the other one is, intersectoral coordination, then appropriate technology that the people themselves can use, you know, to assess and, and help themselves. Dr. Jane Igali, a family physician, thank you so much for coming to our studio to enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's it on the Media Review segment this week. That's it on this episode of the program. Do join us same time next week for more on Insights. I'm Namdi Odiko. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. Stay safe. <laughs>